few months ago, I had a mostly working game. We had some enemy AI, we had some terrain generation, we had some menus, and we even had some cool features like procedural crafting. But the codebase was clunky and hard to work with, making adding new features a chore. It was bad. Bad enough that I decided I needed to rewrite the entire engine with some structure. Something tried and true. Something even more consistent than you failing at achieving your dreams. But what if during that rewrite, we uncovered a bigger, more sinister problem? Something that can't be hidden in the code. Something that is unavoidable. Something even bigger than the game itself. What the fuck is this piece of shit? This is the story of how my game engine rewrite that started out as a simple transition into using an ECS spiraled into a mess of shaders, sprites, stacks, lighting, and the absolute final boss of the last few months, the grass. This is my journey to finding an art style that sucks a little bit less. The initial plan was simple. We take the existing dog shit stuck together with spit and prayers code and throw it in the trash where it belongs. Then, we bring in the pristine luxury design, the ECS. We make the swap and then pick right back up where we left off in the last video with the procedural crafting. The old system was clunky. Like, look at this. We have pointers to structs that then point back to the same struct. Why? 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 The ECS simplifies most of these issues and adds additional benefits like being able to reuse components and systems across anything we add to the game later. I won't go into too much detail on how it actually works, but if you really, really are dying to know, you can join the Discord down below and we can discuss it there. Basically, we have entities, the entities have components, and then our systems act on these components. Very simple, very easy. However, during all this stripping back of the code base, I realized that I still was not happy with the look of the game. It looked pale, bland, and unimpressive. I dove into shaders for the first time a little bit ago and made some minor improvements, but the real problem was much deeper than that. The art was bad, and being a programmer, that left me with two choices. The first, to get better at art, or the second, to hire somebody who was already good at it. I don't really like the idea of having to manage a project and an artist, and I'm not great with giving directions, so I thought that I'd give a shot at actually improving at art for once. At this point, I know that if I do the art myself, the game is never going to look as good as it could, so I decided to deep dive into what made certain games stand out, and what made others feel generic and bland. I discovered a few things, the most important one being this little thing called art direction. Art direction is exactly what it sounds like, a direction for the art in the game. It's a little bit more complicated than that in the sense that art direction is there to direct how the art gets made. There might be certain limitations to color, shape, or style. For example, I'll use one of my favorite games here, Bioshock. The color scheme is reflective of the game being underwater, and there is a clear style with all of the architecture being in the Art Deco style of the 1950s. The game takes things that already work and then combine them together in a way that creates the Bioshock atmosphere. This is pretty surface level, so I encourage you to look more into this on your own if you're interested. Remember, I'm just a lowly programmer. I really don't know too much about art, but the idea of art direction and finding a look and feel for the game has been very prominent in my mind pretty much since I began the project, and I now had a name for it. This led to many searches for how to find or pick an art direction, and also lots of searching on what exactly could be done in 2D. I watched hours of content on art direction, how to pick one, what it is, and how it works. I started with some basics, like picking a defined color palette based on the feel I want for the game, but something was still missing. The look to the game needed an update, but I didn't even really know what was missing. But let me tell you, when the YouTube gods graced me with the next few videos in my algorithm, I knew that I had stumbled across gold. This was one of the best discoveries I have ever made on the platform. As soon as I saw this, I knew this was the way to go. Shit. We have to get her back. Come. This is what the game needed to look like. But what was it? 
Sprite stacking is a technique where you stack a bunch of slices of a sprite on top of each other with just a slight offset in the y direction. The resulting effect looks like a 3D object, but in reality, there is no 3D geometry at all, just a bunch of quads. I consumed these videos, I watched them all multiple times, and I knew that without a shadow of a doubt, this is what the game needed to look like. I could see the potential. Imagine this kind of look with some nice pseudo 3D lighting and some 3D particles, some beautiful shaders, some weather effects, maybe seasons even. Then take that, set it in a unique fantasy world with technology based on alchemy and elixirs, and add building fortresses to defend your alchemic creations on top of that. Oh yeah, damn. Damn, boy. Damn, boy, he's thick, boy. That's a thick ass boy. Damn. Ba -ba! So you could say I was a little excited at the possibilities. I got to work as soon as I could. This lovely gentleman, Gizmo199, was kind enough to have a nice little tutorial series for us to plop down and yoink straight into our game. Hang on a minute. What is this? That's not Zig. Okay, fast forwarding a bit here, I used Gizmo's tutorial series as a base and rewrote it in Zig and Raylib. The basic effect was a bit tricky to implement, but if you slam your head on the keyboard enough times, eventually things just start working. Oh yeah, there we go, look at that. Sprite stacking itself was one thing, but in order to make the game feel even better, I needed to create more of a world with my sprite stacks. That meant two things initially, lighting and grass. <laughs> Lighting was something that there was no tutorial on. I once again took to YouTube and consumed everything there was about 2D lighting. There really is such a lack of information about this kind of thing that I was left to figure it out for myself. This is part of what makes this project so enjoyable for me, but also when you lack direction completely, it really slows down progress, as you're left doing more research than coding, which is less fun, at least for me. I did come up with a pretty good idea for the sprite stacks for some basic lighting, and for that I decided to use a combination of two different types of lighting. We have global lights that come from the top of the screen and act as the sun, and we have support for point lights as well. I decided now was the time to get the basics in, in case I needed to adjust anything relating to the sprite stack rendering pipeline. I'm going to put global light in quotation here because it's less of a global light at the moment and more of a hint at the sun being there with some minor shading. This will be more of a global light after I work on adding shadows, but that's for a later date. For the point lights, we get the direction of the light and then calculate the distance of each pixel on the sprite stack that's supposed to be lit. The effect here is pretty minimal, but eventually much later I got it to look like this. After I started playing around with lighting, I ran into my first major roadblock. You see, there's a reason you don't see more sprite stacked games out there. Most of the footage I was able to find were demos in Game Maker. There were a few full games out there featuring the effect on Steam, but that's it. And the reason for this probably isn't too surprising if you have more than two brain cells, it's performance. In a 2D game, your sprites are just textures drawn onto a quad. A quad is four vertices at minimum if optimized using something like GL triangle strips. Each slice of a sprite stack needs to be rendered onto a quad, and each sprite stacked object can have a differing number of slices. For example, the trees have 128 slices, the grass has 8 slices, and this lamppost has 64. So a single sprite stack, instead of being one singular quad, now at minimum is 8 times as big. This is why in many of the sprite stacking demos and games, you will see the trees being drawn as billboards. This keeps the trees as a singular quad and helps reduce the performance overhead of rendering so many of them. I quickly went from over 500 FPS when drawing just a tree, to then when I was drawing just a 10x10 10 10 grass patch, around 200 FPS. This might not seem as bad to you, but remember, there are going to be hundreds of sprites on the screen at once. With just 100, I was dropping over 300 frames per second. And look at how small this grass patch is. These patches will need to absolutely cover the screen. There's simply no way this is going to scale at all. I had to find another way of rendering these sprites. One of the reasons why performance tanked so hard was because of how I first implemented the global lighting. Now, I'm going to dive into some shader code here, but don't let it scare you. You're a big boy and mama didn't raise no bitch. Basically, there's a variable in the shader for the current slice that we're on. On the CPU, we pass this variable for each iteration of the loop starting at the bottom. So index zero would be slice zero, the bottom most slice. As we iterate through all of our slices, we can increase the brightness, mimicking how the sun would light an object if it were directly above it. The main issue with doing it this way was that for whatever reason, only the final iteration of the loop was being passed into the shader. I'm not sure if this was due to Raylib's batching system or if it's an OpenGL thing or what, but this made me unable to apply lighting per slice. 
So to get around this, I instead ended the call to the shader after every loop, essentially forcing a draw call to the shader for that iteration and applying the lighting. This worked fine for a few objects, but obviously as we scaled it up, the more draw calls we had, the worse the performance was. The first thing I did to increase performance was to calculate the global lighting using a texture. And then for some reason, I tried to do this for point lights as well. Uh, when that didn't work, I scrapped both and tried to implement deferred lighting. I won't get into deferred lighting here because it's a bit outside the scope of this video, but after trying for around a week for several hours a day, I scrapped that too and eventually realized that my original plan of using a texture was perfect for my global lights, but I could use a more standard distance-based calculation for my point lighting. This resulted in some minor gains, as you can see here, I was able to get around 300 FPS with several patches of grass this time, around 300 to so grass stacks. However, there was one improvement that I knew that I had to make for the grass after this. The final boss of performance, GPU instance. This grass needed to be absolutely everywhere in the game, and rendering it here like this simply did not scale. One way around this that is very common in games is using GPU instancing. This is a method of rendering where instead of passing the positions of the grass from the CPU to the GPU every frame, we do this once, then cache the positions in a buffer on the GPU, and then simply reuse this buffer for drawing our grass. Now, I understood that this had to be done. I understood why this needed to be done, and I even understood how it worked. But I simply had no concept of how to implement it at all. I did watch this really handy video by Acerola several times, and that got me most of the way there conceptually. But the big question I still had was, how do I do this in Raylib? And it turns out you can't. Well, you can because I did, but you can't do it out of the box. I'm gonna give a pretty high level overview of Raylib here and how it works. I just know this is probably glossing over a few key details for the sake of brevity, but this is kind of necessary for you to understand what's going on here. Essentially, Raylib is a wrapper library around OpenGL. Inside Raylib, there is a module called RLGL, which is the Raylib library itself uses. RLGL batches common OpenGL calls together to make working with the library less cumbersome. This is good news because it means that Raylib is already setting up OpenGL for us, and all I needed to do was somehow get Raylib and raw OpenGL working alongside each other but I had no idea how to do that. I literally searched high and low across the internet. There were no examples on the website, no examples from Googling, and Claude didn't really know either. I was mostly lost until I went to the one place no man should ever have to go. Discord. On a whim, I decided to search through the Raylib Discord server and holy shit, what is this? Point particles. I wonder what that could be. Oh my god, this was it. This is how you can get OpenGL and Raylib working alongside each other. It really didn't seem that complicated at all. Since Raylib handles most of the setup and control over OpenGL, it looks like we just have to set up a buffer, and boom, there we go. Oh, wait, what? Okay, the problem was... I'm retarded. Dude, what the fuck is this? Okay, I have a really good feeling about this. Come on. <gasps> That works. Does this work with more than one? A thousand? Uh, not quite. Is this it? Is this it? <gasps> Come on, baby. Oh, yes. Yo. There we go. Oh, there we go, baby. It's too easy. All right, we just got everything ported over. Let's see. And fucking nothing. Fuck. Oh my god, dude. Fuck me. I'm close, but nothing. Oh my god, my fucking vertex attributes were wrong here. This is, why is this two? This should be three. Fuck me, man. Oh, oh there we go, baby. <laughs> yo. It has no rotation, but yo. Let's fucking go. Look at it. The positions are fucked. What in the fuck is going on here? Is it this? Because I'm passing it as a parameter, I have to const cast it? Nah. That would be fucking retarded. Zig. What? You don't want this? Is it here? No? Okay. Where are we? <gasps> Ooh, shit. Is that them over there? Please. I think this is it. This is it, baby. Come on now. That's it. We did it. Are they rotating? 
they are. Oh, that is nice. Look at that. And holy shit, look at that FPS, baby. That is like 80,000 quads right there at close to 500 FPS while recording. It's just that easy. So anyways, that took around two months or so, but after I finally finished that, I decided to fuck around with some wind effects, but scrapped it because it looked like your mother. <laughs> and then also I tried to get grass patches to work with my 32 by 32 tile sizes. I went through a few iterations, but nothing was really working. So for now, I just made the grass the same size as the tile and it looks pretty bad, but I'm leaving it for now. I really wanted to do a one by one grass blade, which looks awesome, but unfortunately the algorithm I used to place said blades was just entirely too slow for that. So a refactor was in order, but it just wasn't worth it at the time. The next hurdle was depth sorting. Claude actually gave me a really clever solution and this was just leveraging OpenGL's ability to sort automatically by adding some depth to my 2D objects in the shader. Uh, the tricky part later was getting the GPU instance versions and the CPU versions to operate together correctly, but it's mostly working now, so I'm just gonna leave it as is. I then went ahead and added some flowers, but that was just for this video. I'm not sure if they're staying. And yeah, that was around three months of work and then a bunch of time off in between getting my ass kicked by my new job. This was definitely one of the harder challenges I faced in this process so far, but it really reminded me how much I enjoyed learning about graphics programming and seeing how far the engine has come really makes me proud. I'm hoping to tackle the building system in this new style next. So if you're not subscribed and want to see that, make sure you like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. I'm sorry there was such a delay in getting this video out, but like I said before, life just got in the way a bit. It happens. I hope you enjoyed regardless and I'll see you guys in the next video.